1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning to Grace Life Bible Church. And we'd also like to welcome those that are joining us this morning via, uh, via the internet live stream. I believe this is our fourth crack at this. And um, Aaron, our tech, was in here this week making further adjustments. And we are hopeful that this is going to be the final adjustment needed to bring everything in sync. Uh, Brother Tom's study from last Sunday was better than some of the syncs have been, but he still had a bit of that uh, kung fu nature to it, where he was moving his body and moving his mouth, and his, it, the, the audio wasn't matching it. So uh, hopefully we're getting that fixed. If it's fixed, if this fixes the problem, then we plan on advertising on social media that we're going to live stream the conference. Okay, if it doesn't fix it and we don't and we cannot get it fixed before next weekend, then I'm not saying anything about it because I don't want to have a bunch of people trying to log into a stream and not have it look very good. So um, just 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 kind of be aware of where we are at with that. This morning we're going to continue the series of studies in the book of First Corinthians. And before Becky and I left to go away for a week and to uh, enjoy some time of fellowship with the saints out there in Maine. We were studying through 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I want to pick that up this morning. Now again, what we're going to cover this morning, um, unfortunately, we're going to hit it this week, and then next week we're going to be preempted by the conference again. So there's, a few, there's been a few interruptions as we've worked our way down through the passage, but hopefully as we teach it, you'll be able to sort of uh, get your bearings back and recall fairly quickly where we were and what we were doing. So... Over the past four or five weeks, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and in doing so, we've been seeking to understand Paul's instructions here regarding physical intimacy in a marriage, okay? Now, in chapter 5 and 6, he dealt with issues outside of marriage and, and, and what that was like and what that was about, and now here in chapter 7, he's addressing some questions that the Corinthians have regarding some of these issues. And, and Paul is, is being direct, he's being straightforward, he's being uh, candid about what, what, what their questions are and what the answer to it is as we've looked at this passage. I did, I, just for your um, own knowledge, in our last board meeting at the end of September, I did ask the other men on the board if they felt that I was taking too long to go through this information, and the consensus was no. And the reason for it is that, as I said the last two times we've, we've been together, folks, there is a ton of information that is out there about this stuff that we are bombarded with all the time in our culture that has totally, absolutely, positively nothing to do with God's Word. And nothing to do with how you can have the mind of God about these things and think through these things in your marriage, prospective marriage, or hopefully future marriages, uh, wherever you might be as far as life is concerned. So I want to, again, just remind you about these things that I've said at the beginning. As we get started here, again, this is sensitive, potentially sensitive information, and so I've committed to you that I'm going to teach the details of these verses regardless of how uncomfortable it makes me to do so. Okay? Second, I've said that I'm not setting myself up as the perfect husband, nor am I setting Becky and I forward as the example of a perfect marriage. Okay? Um, that being said, though, I'm going to teach some of this stuff out of the experiences that I've had, that we've had, uh, as husband and wife. And I'm going to try to strike a balance between sh uh, sharing those things that have helped Becky and I without giving, or giving all the details of our personal life together. And last, I already discussed in advance with Becky what we're going to say, especially in this one. I said, here, read this and tell me what you think making sure that I'm, you know, not going too far. And at one point, I apparently was, because we made some changes. We, we took the penknife of Jehudi to that lesson and crossed a few things out there. But anyway, um, all that being said, and last, I'm going to endeavor to be real and frank with you about this stuff without being graphic. But without, with all that being said, I want to finish talking about verse 5. At the end of the message two weeks ago, we got to verse 5. I said a few things about it, but I told you that the next time we were together, I was going to come back and deal with verse 5 in more detail, and then talk to you about the verse from a practical standpoint. So look with me at verse 5. He says, defraud ye, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word this morning. We pray now that as we come to it and look at it again, and are talking about marriage and physical intimacy within marriage, 
that we'll have clarity from your word about this, and that we will seek to take our thinking and align it with your thinking. Align it with your word and what you say about these things. And enjoy the resultant peace that comes to a relationship when we try to function on the basis of your mind and not our own. We're grateful for these things. In Christ's name, amen. So if you look there at verse 5, verse 5 is the fifth verse in the chapter where he's been dealing with issues related to their questions. Okay, And he says in verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, so we're just going to be sort of real tactical here and surgical with this verse at first as far as explaining what it means. And then my second point is going to be to talk to you about it practically and give you some thoughts regarding it of, of what it might look like and so forth in the details of your own life and your marriage. Okay? So he starts off verse 5 and he says, Defraud ye not one the other. Okay? Defraud ye not one the other. That's the first phrase of the verse. The verb defined here, defraud, is once again a present active imperative. So what that means is that Paul is commanding the Corinthians. He's saying, defraud ye not one the other. This is not just a mere suggestion. This is not just a mere, ah, you guys might want to think about doing this. No, this is Paul saying, this is how this should be done. Okay, pay attention to what I'm saying to you, is the, is the sense, or the force, or the impact of what he's saying here when he says, defraud ye not one the other. Okay, So the verb defraud, the verb defraud Paul is commanding the husband and wife, not to defraud each other. So then that ought to ask, that ought to raise a question in your mind, okay, well then what does he mean? What does that mean when he says, don't defraud? If he's going to command the husband and the wife not to defraud one the other, then the thing you need to understand is, well, what does it mean to defraud somebody? Well, the English verb defraud carries the following meanings, according to Noah Webster's 18, uh, 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language, okay? Defraud. Defraud means to deprive of right. It means to deprive of right. So if I'm going to defraud you of something, I'm going to deprive you of something that is rightfully yours. To deprive by right, either by obtaining something or by deception or artifice. So if I'm going to defraud you, there's going to be malice aforethought, as it were, it's going to be set out in advance. There's going to be a deception involved in it. And it's going to be to deprive somebody of something that is rightfully theirs. Okay? By taking, here's another, or, so still defining the word, or by taking something wrongfully without the knowledge or consent of the owner to cheat, followed by, uh, uh, followed by of before the thing taken as to defraud a man of his right. To withhold wrongfully from another what is due him. Now that's interesting. It says to withhold wrongfully from another that which is due him. Now, let me ask you a question. In the context of this passage, what is he talking about? He's talking about physical intimacy within marriage. Right? He, and he even uses this terminology. If you go back, look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife do what? Benevolence, okay? So does the, is, the, is the wife do something by the husband in that verse, okay? And then he goes on to say, likewise also the wife unto the husband. So if you're thinking about the idea of defrauding, to defraud is to withhold wrongfully from another person what is due him. In this context, it is very clear what he's talking about. He is talking about one spouse withholding physical intimacy from the other spouse. Okay? And the Scriptures are using the term here, defraud, to capture the meaning of what, that, of, of, of what that's about. To prevent one wrongfully what obtaining what he or she may justly claim. To defeat or frustrate wrongfully. Okay? Now, given the context, as I already said, it is clear then that the verb defraud here in verse 5 is referring to the sexual intimacy within the marriage. Now, how do I know that? Because everything in the context 
has led up to this point. Go back and look with me at verse 2. Go back, well, in verse 1 he says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So we've talked about that, right? Is there anything wrong with never touching a woman in a physical, intimate way? Not according to God. Okay? Then he says, verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Okay? So how, again, how do the man and the woman avoid fornication? How do they avoid sin in this case? They avoid sin by getting what? By getting married, right? So we've already went over that. Look at verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So the husband and wife in verse 3 are to render unto each other due benevolence. So in verse 2, the reason they get married in this context is to avoid fornication so that they have a, a, a proper outlet for that desire for physical intimacy in, in their lives. And the proper channel, the proper outlet uh, for that is in the marriage. And so they enter into the marriage to avoid fornication in verse 2. Now that they're in the marriage in verse 3, there's, a, there's due benevolence that each has to the other. The husband to the wife, and the wife also to the husband. We talked about that. And then we got verse 4, where he says, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. And so we saw in verse 4 that the husband nor the wife has power over their own body, but the other spouse. And so we talked about what all that means, right? And then you come to verse 5, and he says, Defraud ye not one the other. It is obvious what he's talking about. He's saying that one spouse or the other should not be seeking to defraud, deprive, wrongfully, physical intimacy from the other spouse. That's what he's getting at, and that's what he's saying. Neither party is to purposefully withhold sexual intimacy from their spouse. And as I already said, and this is important that you hear me about this, as I already said, neither spouse is to use physical intimacy as a weapon in their marriage to punish manipulate, or get even with their spouse. Okay? That is not what God created it for in your marriage. That is not what it is for, and these verses make that abundantly clear. The word defraud, now listen, the word defraud is indicative here of a premeditated action. It's that person has done something to me, either the husband or the wife or vice versa, that person has done something to me, and on account of the fact that they have not done what I wanted, they've wronged me, they've not performed, they haven't measured up to my standard, I'm going to get even with them by purposefully withholding what? Physical intimacy in that marriage. Paul says, defraud ye not one the other. Okay? Don't use it as a manipulation device. Don't use it as a tool to get what you want. Don't use it as, well, I'll give you what you want when you give me what, you, what I want, and until I get it, I'm not giving you what you want kind of a business. Now, folks, do people do that kind of stuff all the time? Thank you for being honest. Human nature is such. We went over that when we looked at verse 4. Okay. Now, but verse 5 doesn't end there. He goes on in verse 5, and he says, Defraud ye not one the other. What's the next word? Except. Is there going to be an exception? Okay. What's the exception? Except it be with consent forever. Is that what it says? Except it be with consent for a what? For a time. Okay. So, here Paul offers an exception to the instruction offered in the first phrase. The first phrase is said unequivocally, okay? Defraud ye not one the other, comma. Are you supposed to defraud your spouse? No. But then he's going to give you this clause of elaboration, right? He's going to give you an exception, and he says, except it be with consent. What does consent mean? Consent means an agreement between two people, okay? So if, if, if my wife and I are going to come to a consent, that means that we're going to have to be talking about this. Uh-oh, you mean I'm supposed to talk about physical intimacy with my wife? 
with my husband, whatever your situation is, hello, yeah, yes you are. Because the only way you're going to operate in that verse there is if you're communicating about these things with each other. Okay? You say, well, Pastor, you know, I, that, I'm uncomfortable with that. Okay, get over it and talk about it. Okay, sitting there pretending like it's going to get better not talking about it isn't going to solve anything, right? And he says, he says, defraud ye not one the other except it be with consent for a time. And again, the word consent means agreement of the mind to what is proposed or stated by another. So if, if one of the spouses wants to abstain, can they just make the, 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 the unilateral proclamation, we're not, we're not going to participate because I say so? Is that what that verse is saying? No, that verse is saying that if there's going to be any, if there's going to be any defrauding, if there's going to be any abstaining, if there's going to be any forbearing of physical intimacy in the marriage, it's going to have to be with what? Consent, okay? And not only that, it doesn't end there. It says that it's to, be, it's to be with consent for a what? For a time. It's to be with consent for a time. So the implication is clear then. If there's going to be any defrauding or abstaining of sexual intimacy in a marriage, it needs to be agreed upon by both the husband and the wife so there needs to be consent, and secondly, it need, that in that agreement, it needs to be agreed that's for a, that it is going to be for a particular period of what? Time. Now, as the consent is reached, wrapped up in that consent is probably going to be a few things, right? Number one would be, well, why are we going to do this? Why are we going to abstain from this for a time, right? That would, that would no doubt be part of that conversation. Another part of that conversation would be, well, how long is this going to be what? How long is this going to be the agreed upon situation, right? With the understanding that when that time is over, whatever the agreed upon amount of time is, both parties are going to come back together again. Okay? Now, look at the next part of the verse. He says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Now, Paul mentions here, fasting and prayer as possible reasons why a couple might agree to a time, to a time of celibacy within their marriage. Well, these are possible reasons why a couple might forego intimacy for a time. They are certainly not the only reasons. Now, I don't mean to be sort of irreverent when I say this, but when I look at this and it says that you may get, so defraud ye not one the other except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to prayer and fasting. I've been married 16 years. My wife and I have had seasons where we've had these sorts of discussions. I'll say more about that later on. But for us, it was never about, hey, listen, we just need to pray more. It was almost always for some other what? For some other reason. Okay? So I don't want you to think that because it says for fasting and prayer, that that's like the only two reasons why you would ever give consent for a time here to abstain from physical intimacy within a marriage. There could be other things going on, okay? There could be, uh, I, I mean, my, you, you can fill in the blanks with whatever those things might be, right? But the point is here is that number one, is one spouse to be defrauding the other without consent? No, okay? Point number two, it piggybacks off point number one. There needs to be consent, and number two, it needs to be for what? A time, okay? Now look at what the verse says. Hang on, I got ahead of myself, I apologize. Remember that the key point here is that regardless of the reason, regardless of the reason for the consent, it needs to be the consent of both the husband and the wife. Now, if I'm going to give consent, that means I am agreeing. 
That means I'm of my own free will and volition am I agreeing to something. Okay? In other words, the element of coercion is out of the equation at that point. I'm not forced into this. She's not forced into this. Neither party is forced into this. They're both giving what? Consent. Because the previous verse just said that neither spouse has power over what? Their own body, but the other spouse. Okay? Now, if you look at verse 5, he says, Defraud ye not one the other except to be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Now watch. And come together what? Again. So at the end of the consented duration of time, there is the understanding that at the end of that period of time, the husband and the wife are going to come back together again and once again enjoy physical intimacy with each other. That's the point, okay? So there's not going to be defrauding. There's not going to be one uh, manipulating and, 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 and uh, holding power over the other. It's going to be a mutual <coughs> exchange, a mutual relationship, where if there's any abstinence within the context of the marriage, it's agreed upon by both parties for a particular time with the understanding that when the time is over, they're going to what? They're going to come back together. Okay? Now, why? Why is that the case? Why is that the situation? Look at verse 5. <coughs> Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again. What's the next word? That. That Satan tempt you not for your what? Now, practically, there's a lot of stuff to unpack here in this verse, and we're going to do that in a few minutes. But right now, I just want you to understand the reason why this instruction is given. The reason why a cessation or abstaining from sexual intimacy within a marriage is to be by consent for a time is because if it's not, Satan will take advantage of the opportunity to tempt sexually one spouse or the other or both. Now, in the context, folks, why did you get married? You got married in verse 2 to avoid what? Fornication. Drop down to verse 8. I say therefore to the unmarried and to widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to what? See, one, one of the reasons, scripturally and biblically, now it's not the only reason. I hope that you married your spouse for more than just physical intimacy. I hope there was... There's more to your relationship than, this, than just that. We'll get into that later. But in this context, this is what he's talking about, right? Why does somebody get married in this context? They get married because they cannot contain their physical, uh, their physical impulses and urges, and so they partake in, the, in the, the channel, the outlet, the place that God established for that to properly be expressed, and that's within the confines of the marriage, right? And why did they get married in verse 2? They got married in verse 2 to avoid what? Fornication. And now that you're in the marriage, and now that, you've, it, now, now that you've enjoyed that physical intimacy and you've had it for a period of time, and now you come to a place in the marriage for whatever reason that there's going to be a time of abstinence and both parties consent for that time. And when that time is over, they need to come back together. Why do they need to come back together after the agreed upon time? Because the verse says that Satan tempts you not for your what? See, Paul knows, and the Holy Spirit knows here through the pen of the Apostle Paul, that if you don't come back together after the agreed upon time, you are now opening yourselves up to sexual what? Temptation. Okay? You need to think about what that means. In the context, Paul instructed men and women to get married to avoid fornication. I already said that. So then what happens when a duly married spouse is defrauded without consent for a time. What happens when that occurs? What happens when one partner in the marriage is manipulating coercive power over the other one or is just simply refusing? Is that what God's Word says the situation should be? Okay? 
What happens when a duly married spouse is defrauded without consent for a time? What's going to happen is there's going to be, if that situation is allowed to endure long enough, that spouse is going to look elsewhere and be tempted to do other things beyond normal to have that, to have that need met, that physical need. Is everybody following what I'm saying? Notice what it says in the verse. It says that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. The English word incontinent carries the following meanings. Number one, it means want of restraint of passions or appetites. So if, I'm, if, I, if a husband and a wife are agreeing for a time, consenting for a time, and that time comes to an end and it's time for them to come back together and one or the other still refuses... What Paul is saying is that refusal is opening the door for Satan to what? Tempt them for their incontinency. For he, they're, they're going to be tempted with a want of restraint. Okay, Because that the, the outlet for that within their life is the fact that they got what? Married. Okay. So when one spouse or the other purposefully defrauds the other of physical intimacy over a prolonged period of time without mutual consent. They are actively, via their behavior, allowing the adversary to gain a foothold in their spouse's life. See, as a preacher, people are always saying, give us the practical stuff. You want practical stuff? Here it is. Don't get any more practical than this. If you're married, Paul's talking to you here. He's talking to you and your wife. He's talking to your relationship that the two of you have together. He's talking to me and my wife. He's talking to you and your spouse. And he's giving you instructions. The Corinthians have asked a question regarding these things, and Paul is instructing them about how these things should function in a marriage. Now, you either believe that God the Holy Spirit knows what He's talking about, and you're going to pay attention to what He says, or you think you know better and are going to figure it out on your own. But last time I checked in my life, every time I go out on my own wisdom, in my own understanding to try to fix a problem with my wife, guess what? <laughs> it don't end up too well. Because it's just me functioning out of my, the reasoning of my own what? my own fleshly mind, and not in accordance with revealed truth. So when we're reading these verses, folks, we are getting the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ on the physical relationship in your marriage. That's what you're getting. The Lord's going to reach right into there and He's going to teach you about these things if you let Him. And when one spouse or the other purposefully defrauds the other of physical intimacy, again, over a prolonged period of time without mutual consent, they are actively being their behavior, allowing the adversary to gain a foothold in their life. Now, if that does not mean that the person that is being defrauded, you know, just has an excuse to go out and have an affair, or to go out and, you know, visit a prostitute, or go out and get addicted to pornography, or go out and do something else. Okay? That doesn't just excuse sin on the part of that person. But what is definitely happening here, according to Paul, is when there is that premeditated defrauding without meeting the conditions described in that verse, you are creating the, the, you are creating the environment spiritually within your spouse for that type of rebellion. Now, that's what I think the verse is saying. So I want to transition to talking to you for a while about some practical things regarding this. Okay? I don't know if you've noticed, but practically speaking, it is often the case that spouses are not evenly matched in terms of their desire for sexual intimacy. I don't know if you noticed that. Okay. Generally speaking, well, although it might not be the case in every marriage, but generally speaking in every marriage, one of, the, one of the spouses is going to be a high-desire spouse. 
and the other one is going to be a low desire spouse. One is going, to, is going to need more physical intimacy, desire more physical intimacy, and the other one is not. And so right away, what do you have? You got conflict, right? When I, when I counsel people about marriage before they get married, I say there's two or three things people argue about in marriage. Number one is the kids, number two is the finances, and number three is the physical nature of the marriage. Okay? So if, if, if I'm entering into a marriage, am I entering into a relationship where one spouse is high desire and the other spouse is low desire, I am already setting this thing up. Now, the thing about it is, is this. Most of the time, you don't know until after you're married. You don't, <laughs> you don't know until after you're married, right? And the reason you don't know is, number one, you're supposed to be what? Fleeing from fornication until you get married. And so now you get married, and now... You know, well, I'll just read it from my notes. Where was I? Well, yes, thank you. Well, both husband and wife may have found it difficult to keep their hands off of each other when they were dating and newly married. Things change in life after you get married. Come on, you guys that are married, you know that's true. Okay? At first it's great and it's wonderful and it's like, oh, oh, and that's all you can think about, right? And it's it's just like awesome and all this stuff, right? And then before you know it, jobs and work and pregnancy and kids and sick parents and loss of jobs and on and on and on and on down the line before you know it, all this stuff happens and you're sitting there looking at each other going, what in the world happened? Don't pretend like you know what I'm talking about. Okay? It's a common misconception. Now, hear me. It's a common misconception that the husband will always be the high desire spouse. That is not true. It may be true more often than not, but it is not true that the husband is always going to be the high desire spouse. I have counseled and dealt with folks in the ministry where the wife was the high desire spouse and the husband wasn't. Now, that's also going to create what? Conflict and friction in the marriage. So when, when you were dating and you were newly married, it was like you, you, you couldn't keep your hands off each other and life was great. But then as I said, life happens, stuff happens, circumstances, the aging process, okay? They all impact each spouse's desire and drive for physical intimacy. And before you know it, what came so easy at the beginning, now you're sitting there in the marriage and you're like, how did we get here? I told you I was going to be real. Just keeping it real, folks. Okay. Problems come in your marriage when couples don't follow verse 5. What did verse 5 say? Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. So one spouse, they do something that makes the other spouse mad. Okay, and in their thinking, it becomes, <clears throat> I'm going to get even. And so the way I'm going to get even is the next time he or she comes and they want, you know what, I just might not be available. I just might not be so willing. And it becomes a situation where now you're using, this, you're using that physical intimacy as a way to manipulate each other and to punish each other. That's not what that verse is saying. Okay? Problems come when spouses and couples, couples, spouses, you should be a spouse, okay, do not follow verse 5 in their marriages. Now, when, when a high desire spouse is continually shut down and rebuffed by a low-desire spouse, they feel rejected. So I don't know who's who in your relationships, but both of you need to hear what I'm saying. Whoever the high-desire and the low-desire one is, you need to both hear what I'm saying. When, if you're a low-desire spouse and your high-desire spouse comes to you and is seeking physical intimacy and they are rejected time after time after time after time and they're rebuffed and rebuffed and rebuffed, 
You know what they're saying? You're saying to them through your actions that they're not worthy, that they're not wanted, and they feel rejected. And guess what happens if they're rejected long enough over a long period of time? If this rejection continues over a long period of time, the high-desire spouse may give up and begin looking elsewhere. Again, as I already said, for their need for physical intimacy to be met. And this is where we start getting into the, into the arena of where people begin to contemplate extramarital affairs and or pornography addictions or worse. Okay? So when God is... When He's telling us this through the pen of the Apostle Paul here, He knows what He's talking about. Okay? It's important then for a low desire spouse. You know, the low desire spouse is like, they just can't keep their hands off me. That's all they want. They just want my body. They just want this. They just want that. Okay, I'm trying to be funny a little bit to lighten the mood, but that's all they want me for. What you need to realize. If you're a low desire spouse, you need to realize that there's nothing wrong with your high desire husband or wife. There's nothing wrong with that. They are who they are, and it's up to the two of you to talk and to work it out. To come and have a consent mutually about how this is going to what? How this thing's going to go. That's what this verse is about. High desire spouses often feel like their lower, low desire spouses call all the shots and get to control the physical intimacy in the marriage. Because there is no physical intimacy unless the low desire spouse says it's okay. And so the high desire spouse feels like they have, that they are being, that there's no power for them in it, and that everything is being done on the terms of that other person. Given Paul's instructions here in verses 4 and 5, this ought not to be the case. Look at verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except to be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. You see that in that arrangement, there's not supposed to be this power structure of one person gets to dictate how all this stuff goes. Now some of you, some of you no doubt are wishing I would just shut up and move on to other stuff. But some of you need to hear this. Your marriage needs for you to hear what I'm saying. Okay? And as somebody who has struggled with these things myself, Becky and I, in our marriage, we're spe I'm speaking from the point of view of having been with you in this. We are all, look it, oh, I better not say that. Low desire spouses, low desire spouses are often craving and desiring other types of intimacy other than just physical. One of the reasons they're low desire is because they feel like their love tank's not filled in other areas. Whether it's spiritual intimacy, whether it's emotional intimacy, whether it's something else. Okay, I told you guys before that sex for your wife is way more emotional than it is physical. Low desire spouse are often craving and desiring other types of intimacy other than just physical. Many times, low desire spouses are needing more spiritual and or emotional intimacy. If these other intimacies are not being met, it can be difficult for a low desire spouse to initiate and or desire sexual intimacy. High desire spouses should not assume that the lack of interest demonstrated by their low desire spouse means that they are unaware or don't care about their physical needs. Look at verse 5 again. Defraud ye not one or the other except to be with consent. Uh, I got a revelation for you here, okay? If you cannot read your spouse's mind. Ooh. Sometimes, people got a whole lot of balled up emotional feelings getting in the way. 
And if you don't talk about that stuff, whatever it might be, you're just going to continue to run headlong into each other and never get anywhere. Spouses cannot read each other's minds. As verse 5 suggests, married couples need to, be constant, need to constantly be communicating with each other regarding these matters. Now, how do I know that based on verse 5? I know that based on verse 5 that if I'm going to come to consent with my wife about something, that means we've got to be what? We've got to be talking about it. We've got to be communicating about it. And guys, that's probably going to mean you've got to actually share your feelings. Which I know, as a guy, we don't like. Right? There's a commercial, no, never mind. This communication needs to be done in a safe and non-threatening manner. Now, listen to what I'm going to say next, okay? Another shock of all shocks for you, possibly. That reality... <clears throat> Reality runs counter to what the media would have you believe. Reality in your marriage runs counter to what the media would have you believe. Okay, what do, you, what do I mean? In TV and movies, instances of physical intimacy are always terribly romantic and spontaneous occurrences. Oh, the stars are aligned, just so, and oh, and everything's all wonderful, right? And the slow music starts playing, and they're looking into each other's eyes, and, and all this sort of stuff, right? And it starts giving you the message that that's what reality is, okay? Can I tell you that when you're both working, and you have two kids, and you have a dirty house, and the dog poop is all over the backyard, and it needs to be mowed, okay? And you have all this stuff going on, Nine times out of ten, you are not going to walk through the house and your wife's going to be there and she's going to look at you and you're going to look at her and it's going to be like, oh. That's not reality. That is not reality. Now, hopefully, you still have that from time to time. Okay? But more times than not, as you get out there and live your life, is that going to be the case? <laughs> if you've been married for any length of time, you know this isn't realistic. Okay. The fact is that married people struggle all the time with physical intimacy in their marriages. It's a fact. The Holy Spirit anticipates it, and through the pen of the Apostle Paul, gives you instruction about how to deal with it. When I was, before we got married, when I was at college, when I was at the Grace Bible College before I got married, I worked in the, I worked in the maintenance department with a guy named Nate Johnson who <laughs> became a friend of mine and came to our wedding. And he was talking to me one day before we got married and just sharing some advice with me about stuff. And he said, you know, once you get married, after a while, you're going to realize that the physical intimacy part becomes hard. And I'm just 21-year-old, and I'm like, yeah, right, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, whatever. Guess what? He was a guy who had been married seven, eight years. He knew what he was talking about a little bit more than I did. Okay. About a year ago, um, after struggling with some of these issues in our marriage, Becky and I encountered something that has helped us tremendously that I want to share with you. And it's something called the intimacy lifestyle. Okay, So this is me as your pastor taking this verse and trying to give you something practical to think about in your life to help you where you are. Okay? The... So I, my wife and I, what we do on a Sunday after church is we have a check-in about what's happening this week. And so we look, we get out, we get out our phones, or go to the calendar, and we say, okay, Wednesday she has ladies' Bible study. Thursday there's band practice before the before the con. See, I already know what's on there, right? 
Thursday at 4.30, I have a haircut. Friday, we've got the conference. Saturday, we've got the conference. And we, we check in about what that week looks like, right? How easy would it be? Well, let me ask it this way. Do we have all the stuff pre-planned out? Do we have all the stuff planned out about what our week's going to be? It's all planned out. I know I'm going to get up in the morning, every morning at 5. I'm going to work out at 5.30. I'm going to make my lunch and Andrew's lunch at 6. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to have a cup of coffee with Becky. Andrew and I are going to go to school. I'm going to go to school from 7.15 to, to, to 3.30. I'm going to come home. When I get home, we're going to see each other. If she's not riding her horse, she's going to eventually get home. We're going to talk. She's going to make dinner. I'm going to do the dishes. The kids are going to do their homework. The kids are going to go to bed. And then we got two hours, her and I, where no one's around. And by this time, I've worked out, worked all day, done all this stuff, I'm ready for bed, and she's ready for bed, and we're sitting there looking at each other, and the time that we finally get, after everything that's happened, where we're alone, and we're like, oh. That's just a fact of life. Okay? And she's been doing ladies' Bible study, and, and uh, taking care of the house, and helping the kids with their homework, and and you know, doing uh, working in her business and so forth. And by the time the end of the day comes, she's in the same situation I'm at, right? And you know what? You could go through the whole week, and you could never schedule intimacy with your spouse. So this thing that is supposed to be a priority in your life as a married person, and we haven't even thought about scheduling it. And a lot of you are like, "Oh my word, you're going to schedule sex?" Yeah, you are. Because it's just as important, if not more so, than anything else you got on that calendar for that week, if you're married. But, Pastor, I want it to be romantic and slow music, and oh, there she is, and oh, there I am, and let's go. It's not reality. It's not. And this verse is telling you that, if you pay attention. So the intimacy lifestyle is based upon the notion of scheduling intimacy with your spouse. It begins with a conversation outside of intimate time. It begins with a conversation outside where both the husband and wife agree together about how often in a particular week they're going to be intimate. Now let me ask you a question. Does that sound like that verse? Defraud ye not one or the other except to be with consent for what? The time? Does that sound like it fits with what this verse is saying? It seems to me that it does. The resulting agreement then should be a compromise between both the husband and the wife. So a comp- what does a compromise mean? A compromise means some people that want more might not get as much as they want, and somebody that might not be interested at all might have to do it a little bit more than they want. Right? So the high-desire spouse might be intimate less often than they would otherwise like, but the low-desire spouse is going to be more intimate than they might otherwise what? Like? And you're coming together in an agreement to make the what? To make the decision. The point here is that both parties are agreeing together about what is realistic and appropriate. And folks, that's going to change. That's going to change. Depending on what you have going on. Depending on the agreed upon frequency of intimacy, each spouse gets a number of days in which it will be their turn to initiate with their spouse. This ensures that both husband and wife are being pursued by the other and that the high-desire spouse is not always pursuing the low-desire spouse. So the system ensures that both spouses feel pursued in the relationship. So, for example, you might agree upon mutually two days a week, right? And then the the, the high-desire spouse, be it the husband or the wife, they'll say, okay, my days are Monday through Wednesday, and the other spouse says, my days are Thursday through Saturday, and it's agreed upon, everybody knows what's going on, and there's communication, and so when the time comes, everybody knows what's happening. 
Some of you are like, well, man, you're, you've cracked a nut, Pastor Ross. I'm serious. The, intimacy, oh, uh, the intimacy lifestyle also then includes a discussion. Now, this is revolutionary, right? Discussion about how the other spouse actually initiates intimacy. How many times have you crossed your wires with your spouse because they did one thing and you read it wrong and you never, had, you never thought to talk about how the other one initiates intimacy? Can I tell you that you need to have that conversation? Because you know what you do when you have that conversation? You take all the ambiguity out of it and all of a sudden this thing that you were like waiting for the stars to align properly on it makes sense and it's clear. When they do this, this, or this, that means it's time. When I do this or say this or whatever it is, that means I'm what? I'm initiating with you. And once an agreement is reached, it needs to be followed. Neither spouse can reject or rebuff the other without a conversation and consent for a readjusting of the agreement. The intimacy lifestyle requires open communication between husband and wife as they constantly are talking through issues together. Becky and I encountered the intimacy lifestyle through a podcast titled One Extraordinary Marriage. I am recommending to you that you seek out this podcast. Now, I will also give you a few disclaimers. I don't agree with everything in it. Okay? So don't think, oh, well, Pastor recommended it. He must agree with everything they say. I don't agree with everything in it. But I know that the information presented there has helped us in our marriage. We've been married almost 16 and a half years, and our marriage has grown considerably over the last 12 months by seeking to implement the principles of the intimacy lifestyle. And this does not just deal with physical intimacy, it also deals with spiritual intimacy, it deals with emotional intimacy, it deals with basically anything that you could conceive of that would fit under the category of marriage. And folks... Most importantly, I wouldn't recommend this to you if I didn't feel that it fit with Paul's instructions about marriage here in 1 Corinthians 7. Okay? I highly re recommend it to all married couples in this assembly. And if you're going to listen, I just want to say the following. Number one, you should listen with your spouse and discuss each episode that you listen to together. Second, they are, they are coming from a Christian perspective. Okay, Now, some of what they say is not necessarily rightly divided, but they're coming from the point of view of the Bible being an authority about these things and God's Word um, uh, being the answer for issues in a marriage. Third, you need to know that they are blunt about things that happen in an intimate physical relationship. So if you're going to be squeamish, don't listen. And fourth, as I kind of already said this, but know that the podcast covers a host of topics regarding marriage, not just physical intimacy. In conclusion, I want you to get two passages. I want you to get Philippians. Another thing that my wife and I have been doing a lot of recently is we've been listening to a pastor named Andrew Farley. Andrew Farley does not rightly divide, per se, um, to the full extent that we do in this assembly, but Andrew Farley understands grace. And he understands some things about grace motivation, and he has taught me some things about grace and how grace works that I had never thought of or considered before. And I want to share with you something in conclusion to this particular study. Go to Philippians chapter 2.
In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, well, in verse 4, he says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You think that verse applies to your marriage? Let this mind, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no rec reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of what? He starts that, ver that passage there in verse 5 and he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to explain how the Lord Jesus Christ was, was equal with God and He left heaven's glory and He took upon Himself the form of a man. And He humbled it. It says there in verse, in verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a mindset of humility. It's a mindset that puts the need of the other before His own. Okay? Now go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth where? In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself what? For me. Where does Christ seek to live His life? In us. If you are a wife, where does Christ seek to live His life? In you as a wife. If you're a husband, where does Christ seek to live His life? In you as a husband. So what if you read this verse like this? What if you read this verse? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I husband, yet not I, but Christ husbands in me. Would that change your thinking about your wife? What if you're a wife and you read this verse, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I wife, yet not I, but Christ wifeth in me. You get my point? What? If you're a wife, what does the life of Christ in you look like as a wife? What does that mind of Christ look like in you as a wife? That mind that humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and esteemed you and I as greater than the cost it was going to take to accomplish salvation. If you're a husband, what would it look like for you to have that mind of Christ in you and for you to look at your wife with that mindset, with that frame of reference, with those eyes, would that change things? It seems to me that it couldn't help but what? Change things. So if you would go back to 1 Corinthians 7 and I'll close. I hope that you folks here that come to this assembly, that are a part of this assembly, that sit under this teaching, that you'll understand what I've been after and what my heart's desire is as your pastor in going through this information. Because, and I said it before and I'll say it again, this assembly, this local community of believers is only going to be as strong as the families that make it up. And the families that make it up, that comprise it, are only going to be as strong as the marriages that you have one toward another. You can come in here and you can play church. And you can put your suit and tie on, and you can walk around and make everybody you know, think everything's great, and go home and be an absolute jerk to your spouse. That's not the life of Christ. Verse 5, defraud you not one the other except to be with consent for a time. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. If you want to know more about the um, intimacy lifestyle and you're a woman and you don't want to talk to me about it, which is fine, talk to my wife.
If you're a guy and you do want to know more about it, you can talk to me. But it's my desire that we in this assembly, that we have the kind of marriages that God intends for us to have. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. Lord, we are, I'm, I'm personally grateful for these saints that have sat here and listened to these studies over the last four or five weeks. Lord, we do pray that the content of these and the practical nature of what we're trying to put forth, that there would be something about this that would, that would soak in, that would resonate in the inner man and in the thinking. And that we would seek to wife and husband as Christ liveth in us. We're grateful for Your grace. We're grateful for Your Word. We're grateful for our total, complete, salvation and justification in your son we ask these things in christ's name amen